Welcome to Chapter 1 of Anatomy and Physiology. Um, first of all, I wanted to kind of show you a couple of things before we got started. So let me pull this up here, if it will let me. I'll get down and put me, move me out of the way. Pull up your course here. Um, <clears throat> when, you, when you first go to your course, and we're sitting here on Chapter 1, and I realize mine's grayed out, and should, yours should be showing, but these are all hidden from you, and they'll show up eventually. But if when you go to Chapter 1, um, right here's the video that you're watching right now. That's chapter one's lecture. Um, right here are the PowerPoints. Um, you can go right here and download the PowerPoints. It's the same PowerPoints. There might be a few extras in there because I sometimes kind of whittle mine out. Um, but uh, uh, right here are the PowerPoints um, for the lecture. Um, something you might want to know about these PowerPoints too when I pull these up right here. If you'll go up here in the top left hand corner where it says file, go to print and if you will change this from full page slides to um, let's see three slides right here you can print this off you can print these slides off and you can take notes on each slide as I'm going through them if you would if you would like to do that it's just a quick simple way to take notes um, that is directly related without having to write down the exact same thing that I'm that, that's already in the PowerPoints that I may reference so <clears throat> just something that you can do, save you a little bit of paper that way, um, and uh, uh, plus give you a way to take notes. Okay, so we'll just go ahead and get started here. Um, you'll have to kind of bear with me. I want to look at the screen and not the camera, so um, we'll go ahead and get started. Chapter 1. Um, the thing about Chapter 1, though, um, first of all, um, hopefully you've already read the chapter. If you haven't read the chapter, I would stop right now. Go read the chapter. This will work much, much better if you've already read the chapter before you before you listen to me lecture on it. Um, listening to me lecture is not required. Um, if you feel like you can get through the course without listening to me ramble on about each chapter, then by all means go right ahead and, you know, cut to the chase of it. But um, uh, it will help you tremendously if you've read the chapter before you listen to me lecture. And that way I'll, I might be able to clear up some of those questions that you would have about the chapter or at least they're kind of fresh on your mind and hopefully that I would I would either bring them to light or let you know that it's not something that you need to worry about okay so if you haven't already read the chapter uh, that's where I would start all right so chapter one um, the the thing about chapter one unfortunately it's uh, kind of boring it's not very exciting it's a lot of informational stuff um, so there's really not much of a dog and pony show uh, chapters two and three and I think maybe four um, might be a whole lot more interactive and note the chapters two, three, and four are very foundational. So those are ones that you'll need to spend a lot of time on. Chapter one is kind of good because it's kind of a welcome to class a little bit. Um, and it's, uh, it kind of gives us an overview of what you're going to expect through the time that we're going to spend together. So it basically just start off talking about what is anatomy. Basically anatomy is the, the shape or the study of the shape and structure of the body and all of its parts. Um, and we can use direct observation, you know, uh, visual observation to see the sizes and relationships of different parts of the body um, when, when, we're, when we're referring to anatomy. And when we do that, the things that we can see that are easily observable in the large structures that we see as part of the body are what we, what we refer to as gross anatomy. Um, and we can use an example. Here's an example of gross anatomy, the things that we can see. For instance, we can see the liver, the gallbladder, the stomach, you know, the spleen's kind of hidden back in here a little bit and the pancreas down here. So that's an example of gross anatomy that we can see all of those things that are present in the body. The other type of anatomy that we have is microscopic anatomy. And this is anatomy that can't be seen with the naked eye and it's going to require a microscope to actually see them. Fortunately, we don't, we don't need a microscope and they've provided us with pictures of those structures that would have to, that we would need a microscope to see otherwise. Um, and this way we can kind of, we can see all the way down here to the cellular level. We can see these cells that are lining, um, these, uh, this sweat gland or the, actually the stomach gland here that makes all the stomach acids that digest the food that we eat. Um, so we can see that on a microscopic level. Most of the time and most of what we're doing, we will focus more on the microscopic level um, or the, the microanatomy level than we will on the gross anatomy level. 
the gross anatomy level is something that you guys are probably already somewhat familiar with, so we don't spend a whole lot of time on it. We'll take and we'll, we'll look at it initially, and then we'll dive down a whole lot deeper into it. So that's what we're going to do. And then, then, of course, it takes it a little bit deeper. Um, and then we're actually seeing internally within the cells the different structures inside the cells, the organelles, um, and uh, and where they're located depending on the type of cell. And we'll, we'll get into that. That's in the next two or three chapters that we're going to talk about that. Now, physiology. Um, physiology is probably more important than the anatomy itself because it it's how we understand how the body works. It's it's our understanding of how it works. It's one thing to know what it what it is and what it's called and to be able to label it. Um, it's a completely different thing to be able to understand physiologically how the body works and what it does and how it does what it does and how it how all of those things tie in together. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about physiology so that you understand, you know, we'll understand the structure. The structures are pretty straightforward. But physiology, where we understand how those structures communicate and work within each other to create a body that actually survives and does things and sets in front of cameras and talks to people, which feels kind of weird, actually. Um, but uh, you, we have a better understanding of how all those things work together. So, all right. Uh, the relationship between the two, uh, anatomy and physiology, um, is best described as, and I've used this term for years, and I would love to say it, let take credit for the term, but form follows function. It has to do with the structure of a particular object within the body has much to do with what its function is. Um, it's, you know, depending on its function, um, it will determine its shape and size. Uh, for instance, if we took, say, uh, a football player, you know, a professional football player that that plays, you know, he's one of them guys that's right up front on the line, you know, that called a lineman. So he's one of those guys that's right up front. And those guys are huge because of the job that they do, their function in what they do. They have to be really, really, really big guys to do their job. Their function determines how big their form is. Uh, you contrast that with, say, a gymnast. You know, um, if you like to watch the Olympics and you watch gymnastics or whatever, um, the gymnasts are typically fairly small, even though they're very powerful. But what they do requires their 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 uh, structure to be in such a way that allows them to be able to do the things that they do, so they're typically much smaller. So depending on what their function is, um, uh, will determine their structure, their size of them. So form follows function. So whatever it is that it does, that's how it's determined. Um, and this is especially true. We see this with muscles, uh, for instance. If we go to the gym and we work our muscles, the muscles get bigger. If we break a leg or an arm or something like that and it's in a cast for six weeks and they pull it out, it, it looks like it belongs to somebody else. It's um, what we call emaciated and scrawny and skinny because we haven't been using those muscles and the body says, hey, look, if you're not going to use this, we can use this material that's in here, so to speak, for somewhere else in the body. So uh, that those muscles wither and they fade if they're not being used. Um, and then once we begin to use them again, they build back up. So that's how anatomy and physiology kind of tie in together. Um, look for these uh, throughout the book, these uh, concept links that will kind of give you an idea. They'll kind of tie something in, um, maybe bring a couple of chapters together. Um, uh, so the, it's, it's just helpful. Um, uh, sometimes these links will clear up a couple of things for you if you're having trouble. So now, now we've talked about anatomy, we've talked about physiology, so now let's start to talk about the structural side of, side of anatomy, uh, the anatomy side of it, um, is there's six levels of organization that we're going to talk about. We'll start with cell, or with atoms, then we'll move on to cells, tissues, organs, organ systems, and then the entire organism is how the body is made up. And this is kind of the way that the book is going to kind of play out too, um, because We'll start out talking about atoms, and then we'll talk about cells, and then we'll talk about tissues. Then we'll talk about organs and organ systems kind of together. Um, and of course, we don't talk, basically, we're talking about the whole organism when we're talking about these individual things. So um, we're going to start out at a very, very low level, and we're going to build up on that. Um, but don't, don't let it fool you, the, the low level when we're talking about 
atoms and cells is actually some of the most difficult parts of uh, anatomy and physiology to understand um, because there's so many things in there and, it's, and a lot of times it's very very new um, for students in it so it's a, a very foreign territory so um, we'll spend some time there my lectures on those may go a little bit longer than the hour that I'm trying to keep them to um, but uh, uh, hopefully that information will be helpful to you so we can see those levels kind of played out here on this slide you know we've got the chemical level where we've got atoms and molecules and then those make up cells and those we put a bunch of those cells together and they make up tissues and then we put tissues together of different types and they create an organ and then we take organs that kind of serve the same purpose like heart and blood vessels and those types of things and that creates an organ system and you tie several organ systems together and you have an organism. So uh, that's basically how all of this works and how all this comes together. So, and that's how we're going to do it. So what we're going to talk about over the next few slides, and I'm going to go through these pretty quickly because it's, it's just an organ system overview of the different organ systems that we're going to cover. We're going, to, we're going to talk about each one of these organ systems in detail, so don't worry about trying to um, gain a whole lot of knowledge out of what we're doing in this chapter over the specific organ systems. Um, what, what you would need to focus on as far as for testing purposes for this chapter would be, you know, what is anatomy, what is physiology, um, those levels of, uh, you know, how the body's put together from atoms to organism level. Um, don't worry about the organ systems, and then we'll talk about um, positions and planes and divisions and different parts and that kind of stuff. Terminology, um, when it comes to anatomy, we'll talk about those just here in just a little bit. So um, the first one of the systems that when we get to this organ system, specifically the first one we'll talk about is the integumentary system, which is the skin. Basically, it's all that skin that covers our body, um, and it protects the deeper tissues regulates body temperature, um, and it also contains a lot of nerve cells and nerve endings for various different things, not only for pain, but for pressure, for sense, and, you know, all kinds of different things such as that. Um, there's kind of a picture, and I don't know why, um, uh, it always seems like when they talk about the integ integumentary system, it's always a naked woman. Um, not really sure why, but I guess every single book that I've looked at, that's the way that it is. Skeletal system. Um, we'll talk about this one following that, but this one I believe is broken up into two different sections where we'll talk about bones specifically, and then we'll talk about ligaments and joints and cartilages and those kinds of things. But the skeletal system as a whole basically provides support for the body. If we didn't have a skeletal system, we'd all be kind of like jellyfish, only not clear like jellyfish are, but we'd be kind of blobby and just lay there and not really be much purpose to anything. Um, absent a skeletal muscle system or a skeletal system. Uh, the skeleton also provides attachments for muscles um, so that our body can move. <clears throat> it's blood, uh, the production of, sorry, it is the site for red blood cell production inside, uh, inside of those, some of those bones, and we'll talk about that. It's also a very big mineral store. Um, there's an example of the skeletal muscle system, and there's actually two parts of that muscle system. Um, that we'll talk about and we'll break that down so don't don't sweat trying to learn it all today because we got we got all semester to work on it so uh the next system will be the muscular system um surprisingly the muscular system can be pretty complicated and we'll get we'll get pretty pretty deep into the the physiology of muscles not only the structure of muscles but the physiology of what makes them work um that way you'll have a much greater understanding for um you know how they how the how important the muscular system is and and how we learn and know more things about it um, and there's a there's a picture of uh, the muscular system or the muscles um, and uh, I'm not don't worry I'm not going to make you go crazy and labeling a bunch of different muscles and those types of things we will probably label uh, some muscles that are very that are very necessary for us to but we're not going to get real crazy and like labeling what is this abdominal muscle here or something like that and um you know we're not we're not going to get that crazy about it but we will talk about you know deltoid muscles and you know gluteal muscles and those types of things so that you know those are relevant to healthcare you know in many ways nervous system nervous system is a very complex system it's a um uh 
a very difficult system sometimes to understand. Um, expect to spend a little bit of time here. Um, I believe this chapter is probably broken up into, or this section is probably broken up into at least two chapters, probably the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. But, you know, uh, we're fairly familiar with that. You know, we understand the brain and we understand that we've got nerves in our body and that kind of stuff, uh, you know. But we'll talk about how all of those things work. You know, we'll talk about them specifically where they're located and, you know, that kind of thing. But we'll get very, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll gain a lot of knowledge in exactly how they work, how they transmit those impulses and send those signals back and forth and, you know, do all those kinds of things. So uh, we'll get we'll get pretty in depth in that. And that's there's an example of those. Um, of course, the brain being the most complex, but. Um, absent any of the other nerves, the brain wouldn't serve a whole lot of purpose either. The endocrine system, um, a system that, that oftentimes is overlooked in its importance um, uh, because I think people don't really understand what it does, but this is a system that actually secretes hormones and all kinds of different communicating and stimulating things into the body to tell different organ systems to do different things. Um, if, uh, you know, when, uh, when we eat something and, and our body senses that we've ate something, a signal is sent to digest food, um, a lot of times it's the endocrine system that plays a critical role in that digestion of food. You know, um, also there's a, it releases other chemical messengers and those types of things, part of the reproductive system as well. So, but it's a complex system, um, and, but well worth spending some time on. Uh, uh, and here's an example of some of the, the glands that are associated with the uh, endocrine system. Um, cardiovascular system is probably one of the funnest ones to cover. Um, uh, it's funny, you know, as a paramedic, um, it seems like every single paramedic I know claims to be an expert at the cardiovascular system. Um, it's just because that's one of them things that uh, they get pretty excited about. Um, it's something that uh, um, we spend a lot of time as, you know, in our paramedic careers dealing with problems and complications related to the cardiovascular system. So um, we'll spend some time on that so you guys will have a, a very good understanding of the physiology of that and the makeup of it and how it's all put together. It's always a fun one to spend some, spend some quality time on. Um, and there's an example of it there. Lymphatic system, another one of those systems, kind of like the endocrine system, it's like the, you know, stepchild of the endocrine system because nobody really cares about the lymphatic system after they cover the cardiovascular system. But it is a very important system um, when it comes to um, our immune system and our immune response. Um, it's vital in that. Um, and when we talk about it later on when we get to this chapter, and we spend some time talking about it, you'll have a much better understanding of why um, the lymphatic system can be one of those systems that gets ravaged with cancer when uh, when someone um, comes down with cancer, has cancer in a, another body system. How the, Why does the lymphatic system sometimes, you know, get involved in that too and become cancerous as well? So uh, we'll talk about that later, but you can see all the lymph nodes and glands and that's related to lymphatic system um, on that picture. Respiratory system is another fun system to talk about. Um, it is the source of a lot of the medical issues and problems that we deal with in healthcare today. Um, uh, much like the cardiovascular system, um, we'll have a very good understanding of the respiratory system and how it works. We'll, we'll even when it's appropriate talk about some medications that affect these systems um, and try to have so that you guys have a little better understanding of those. They'll be common medications. It won't be like I'll be you know, grabbing some, you know, uh, some crazy medication to throw in there so that, you know, it confuses you guys. No, it's, it's just to provide clarity when I do that. It's the last thing I want to do is confuse you. So there's a respiratory system. Digestive system, um, uh, an interesting enough system to cover because it does a lot of things. It's a vital system um, in our body. Um, oftentimes we don't realize how vital, um, but think about how many times you eat in, in a given day or a week or a month. Um, and it should become pretty obvious how important the digestive system is. Um, there's uh, the, the organs that are involved in the digestive system. Urinary system, it's another system that I like to cover. Um, uh, it's another vital system, um, extremely important. Um, it regulates a lot of things in the body, um, eliminates waste. It's one of those areas in the body along with the liver that, that 
um, are responsible for ridding the body of toxins. Um, and you may not realize this, but the body recognizes most medications that we take as a toxin. Um, and it wants to eliminate it from the body because it doesn't belong. It doesn't belong there. So when we take Tylenol or ibuprofen or something like that for a headache or some little ache or pain, the body wants to get that out. It's like, it says, hey, this doesn't belong. Um, and it wants to be rid of it. So it tries to get it out of the body or eliminate it from the body. And it also helps regulate water and some of the electrolytes that are vital to the body as well. The urinary system does. So um, it, it's a neat system to talk about. Um, and we'll we'll spend a, we'll we'll spend some quality time in that in on that system as well. The reproductive system. Um, if you ask any teenage boy, they will tell you they know everything about the reproductive system, and they probably know very little, if anything, about the reproductive system. Um, uh, you can't believe everything you see on the internet. Um, just saying, um, and be careful what you search for when you type reproductive system in the, on the, on Google. So, um, but the reproductive system will talk about that. There's a lot of things that go on both for males and females. Um, a lot of things that are important to normal function. Um, and we're not just talking about making babies. We're talking about just normal everyday functions, the hormones and the, you know, all of those types of things that are present within the bodies of men and women um, that stem directly from the reproductive system. Um, it, it's important to talk about those because there are a lot of um, diseases and illnesses and problems out there um, that we deal with as healthcare providers um, that affect the reproductive system or that the, they're the, the problem lies in the reproductive system. So um, males and females, um, we'll talk about both of those. Um, and that would be the that will be the last chapter that we'll talk about is the reproductive system. Um, so um, some of the other things that we need to talk about um, in order for an organism to maintain life, um, there are some functions that an organism needs to be able to do. It needs to be able to maintain some boundaries that separates its internal environment from the external environment. Um, also needs to have some form of locomotion in general. I realize trees don't move around and they are a living thing, but um, trees are a little different in the context of what we're talking about. But they need to be able to move substances um, at the very least, which trees are able to do. We're able to walk and move and we move substances around our body. Um, the, the, that particular life form needs to be able to be responsive to sense changes within its environment and react to those changes, either internal environment or external environment. It needs to be able to break down, absorb proteins and nutrients and those kinds of things that are vital to its survival as well. So uh, um, in order to maintain life, um, organisms must be able to do these things. They also, uh, uh, one of the things um, that as it relates to digestion and breakdown and absorbing nutrients, one of the things that we'll talk about pretty in depth is metabolism. Um, basically, metabolism is a chemical reaction within the body. Um, it's where complex molecules are broken down into smaller ones or um, lar smaller molecules are built up from, or larger molecules are built up from smaller ones. Um, Typically, these are it's a it's a means to either produce or store energy um, um, for various purposes throughout the body, um, and most of the time this is regulated by hormonal activity within the body. Remember, we talked about that endocrine system just briefly. Endocrine system plays a key role in metabolism. Um, also, excretion is the elimination of waste. Um, from metabolic reactions. So when we break down stuff, uh, the body's going to take and keep the things that are essential to it to survive, and then it's going to need to get rid of some waste products. Um, so there needs to be a means to be able to do that. Um, so the ways that it does that is either through urine or feces. Um, typically, you know, urine we kind of understand is kind of a filter in the body, um, but it's a liquid filter. Um, Whereas the liver is more of a solid filter, um, and that's typically where we see the you know feces come from, is in part from the liver. Some a lot of a lot of what uh, where the feces comes from is we've broken down everything in the digestive tract, and what's left just is not needed by the body. So it's it's what we've ate, and the body it just never leaves the digestive tract, in it, so it just stays there and it's eliminated. So. Um, <clears throat> reproduction is very important, especially 
on a cellular level to keep an organism recycling itself and rebuilding. Um, so, you know, when we talk about reproduction, we're not just talking about creating a new individual organism like, you know, a, a baby or an infant. Um, we're talking about cellular reproduction, the, uh, the ability of cells to repair itself and, and continue to grow and produce future generations as well. Um, also, uh, oftentimes cells need to increase in size or grow in the number of cells, so it, uh, an organism needs to be able to grow um, to meet the demands. Remember, form follows function. If we stress a particular uh, group of cells in the body, um, that group of cells may respond by increasing the number of cells or increasing the size of cells or even both. Um, we see that especially true, you know, uh, when people go to the gym and work out um, and, you know, try to build their muscles. What they do is, is they wind up increasing not only size, but the number of muscle cells present um, because of that stress that they've created and they've, they've put their body under. In order to survive, bodies are, uh, we need nutrients. Um, an organism needs nutrients and especially humans. Um, so it's those chemicals that we need for energy and cell building which includes, for us, includes carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, vitamins, and various different types of minimal minerals. Um, if you'll notice, um, it doesn't say like chocolate or, you know, Dr. Pepper or those types of things on there, um, but uh, I honestly feel like I need those things to survive. Um, but actually, if we look at those on a, on a, on a uh, smaller scale, um, it does contain carbohydrates and those kinds of things, but most of them are not good for us. So, um, uh, ideally, we're only putting those healthy things in our body in a, in a quantity that is necessary for our survival and not more than that. But um, I wish I could, uh, I could learn that myself and, and uh, take in a few less carbohydrates. Um, oxygen, it is required for chemical reactions. The interesting thing about oxygen, you guys are going to completely think of the, change the way that you think about oxygen once we get to that chapter and we talk about um, um, energy production and those types of things. Um, you're going to think differently about oxygen. Um, well, I'm not going to get off into the weeds on that just yet. We'll talk about it later, but um, oxygen is very important to chemical reactions within the body for specific purposes, well beyond what we oftentimes mistakenly believe that oxygen or how oxygen is used. So um, a big thing that, that we need uh, is water. 60 to 80 percent of our body weight is made up of water. Um, so it is a very important. It's the most abundant chemical in the body, if we want to refer to it as a chemical. Um, it is the universal solvent. Um, it helps with meta uh, metabolic reactions. Um, it is vital to the survival of the body. If we, if we get rid of too much water, then we create higher concentrations of um, chemicals and elements in the body. If we take on too much water, then we create, we dilute things down and create lower concentrations of those things in the body. Think of it as, you know, when you, uh, you get your tea just perfect, your, your iced tea just perfect, and you got just the perfect amount of sugar in it, it's perfect. You got about a half a glass of it and the waitress sneaks over while you're not looking and fills it back up with regular tea. Now all of a sudden it's diluted down the sugar content because we've added more tea to it. Well, that's very similar in both forward and reverse reactions with water. If we have too much or not enough, it can actually cause some problems. Um, a good stable body temperature for us, it's 98 or 98.6 um, and the correct atmospheric pressure um, because we're going to need that for gas exchange. And we'll talk a little bit more about gas exchange um, when we get to, um, when we're, we'll talk some about it when we're talking about red blood cells. We'll talk some more about it when we're talking about, um, actually, we'll talk about it early on, maybe in the next couple of chapters, but red blood cells, we'll talk about it again. And when we talk about the respiratory system, we'll talk about that again. Um, you'll have a pretty good idea of what goes on during the gas exchange process. Um, so that so that it should be helpful and then I, and then i've even got another little article that you're you'd be welcome to read um that might help clarify that just a little bit more so um we can take all of these things that are going on and we can see all the things that our body needs the requirements of them um, we can see um, getting rid of co2 taking on oxygen filtering down here taking on nutrients and fluids um, more nutrients over here you know that kind of thing we can just see how that works and we're eliminating things down here that we don't need. Take in food, take in oxygen, eliminating things down here. Um, uh, it shouldn't be too much of a surprise to anybody right there. So homeostasis, 
is uh, the our ability to maintain a stable internal environment. It is absolutely critical that our body is able to maintain the environment in a way that it is productive and workable. Um, but re realize that it's a dynamic state. Um, it's constantly changing and shifting and moving and adjusting and um, making sure that things are working right. So it's not just, hey, we got there and then it stops and then um, something changes and hey, we got there and it stops again. It is constant. It is a constant state of trying to maintain that balance. So uh, when we have an imbalance, though, we call it a homeostatic imbalance. It's basically a disturbance in homeostasis that, that is the result of a disease. Typically, we see it as a result of a disease, but it actually can be because of something that we've taken into our body, something that we've um, uh, shouldn't have taken, something that we should have, shouldn't have done, and we create an imbalance. The, the best example that I have of this is, um, uh, several years ago, there was a contest by a radio station who could drink the most water in the, in the shortest amount of time. Um, and there was three or four participants in this contest. Um, and uh, they drank all this water. I don't remember how much they drank, but it was some ridiculous amount, like six or eight gallons of water in 30 minutes or something, some short amount of time. Um, and uh, um, somebody won, and I don't remember how much they did, but the person that came in second place actually left the, the radio station, went home um, after they had, you know, they didn't win the contest, went home, passed out, was rushed to the hospital and died. Um, because what happened to them is they had taken in so much water and their body had absorbed so much water that it had diluted down all of the vital um, nutrients and everything in their body to, to the point, so, so dr dramatically and drastically to the point that the body cells were no longer able to function um, and, the, and the body just stopped working. Um, uh, that, that's probably a, a very extreme example of, you know, homeostatic imbalance, but it kind of gives you an idea of how we can affect um, and cause an imbalance as well if we're not careful with what we're doing, um, even as healthcare providers or just in our everyday life. Um, so our body tries very hard to maintain that balance. Um, and uh, and rightly so. And we can kind of see that it uses an example of a teeter-totter to uh, maintain the balance and it's <clears throat> working constantly to maintain that. So if we, we get a variable, it's going to be detected. Um, some information is going to be sent to the control center that's going to say, hey, look, something's changed. It's going to send out a signal that's going to cause an effect to push the scale back down, to push the scale back to where that it needs to be. So basically that's it in a nutshell is um, homeostasis is going to try to maintain that balance. All right. So in order to maintain that homeostasis and maintain that balance, it's essential that the body is able to communicate all the way, you know, with other organ systems together. So there's got to be a way that the body can talk to one organ system, can talk to the other organ system um, effectively and communicate well. Um, so one of the ways that it does that is through the nervous system or hormonal system. Um, and what happens is, is there's a, there's a, a information sent and then we have a receptor on a particular organ that receives that signal or receives uh, that information. And it, and it tells that particular organ system, hey, this is going on over here and we need to change this over here. Um, so it's part of that. It's a very complex communication system that our body uses in order to, to con communicate with itself to maintain that homeostatic um, balance. So uh, the most important part of that is the control center is the brain. It's typically the control center is the brain um, and uh, it determines the set point. So at what point does a stimulus cause the control center to actually do something? So it says, hey, right here, if if we get something that comes underneath here, we're, we're probably not going to pay any attention to it. But if it goes past this point, this is our set point. If it goes past this, then it's going to get our attention. And we're going to take a look at that information, analyze that information, and determine what the response should be. So that's what the control center does. And then it's going to send that out, that, that response, to an effector basically means it's going to send that information out to stimulate a target organ or a target system in order to cause the effect that it wants to have to correct the imbalance that's going on. 
Okay. Um, one of the one of the ways that it does that, or one of the measurements, or one of the homeostatic control mechanisms, is called negative feedback. Th this one is. Um, Think of it much like your thermostat that you have in your house. You say, "Hey, I want the temperature to be in the in the house to be 70 degrees," and it's it's you know 68 degrees in the house, so that the heater kicks on, and the heater kicks on and warms it up. And but when it reaches 70 degrees, the set point, it shuts the heater off, um, and then the heater won't come back on until it reaches the cool set point. So at 68 degrees, it'll kick on again and kick off at 70. So very much like a thermostat is how negative feedback works. Positive feedback, on the other hand, is a little bit different. It, it actually increases the stimulus to push the reaction a whole lot further. So it causes reactions to happen at a faster rate. Common sense would think, well, why would we want some reactions to happen at a faster rate? Well, the best example of it is, is um, blood clots. Well, you know, when, we, when we're bleeding, and a chemical reaction is laid out because of the, the damage to the to the tissues that causes us to bleed, a signal is sent out. And then that causes like a domino effect of everything to start to fall. And one domino causes the next domino causes the next domino. So the whole thing moves at a fairly rapid rate so that clotting can happen so we don't bleed to death. Um, childbirth is very much the same way. It's, we get one stimulus and it causes the whole thing to go. Um, so that's an example of positive feedback and how it's important in the body that we have a positive feedback system. Okay? All right. So that's all the kind of the heavy stuff for this. The rest of this stuff that we're going to talk about is the language of anatomy. Um, it's the terminology that's going to be used to help pre prevent misunderstandings. So when we're documenting things, when we're writing them down and we're charting those things, um, we need to make sure that we're using terminology that everybody understands. So when I read, when I write something down, I know what I'm thinking up here. Usually I do. You know, it's hopeful. Um, but being able to communicate that in such a way to where that you understand what it is that I'm talking about, or that physician understands, or the you understand it or I understand it four years from now when I look at it in their chart again. We need to be able to use terminology that's going to enable us to to kind of document things in the in a in a way that's going to stand the test of time and or that we're going to be able to understand it um, and everybody's going to understand it. So what we do is we have terms that we use for position, region, direction, and structures. So we have terminology. There's a list of terminology under each one of those bullet points right there that we use to help pinpoint what it is we're talking about. So um, the first thing that we need to understand when we're referencing positions, when we're referencing body positions, locations, and that kind of thing, we're always referencing them in accordance with what we refer to as anatomical position. And that's the standard body position that we use so that we're all referencing from the same points. Um, so when we're talking about this, um, we're talking about this, you know, palms forward, you know, facing forward, you know, this is what is, is considered anatomical position. And then we can look at and we can see all these regions and areas and that kind of thing that we're, that, that we can talk about. Um, but this is anatomical position. So when we say when we're referencing something, we're always referencing it from this position. So no, regardless of the position that your patient is in, you're going to have to reference it with this positioning in mind. Okay. Directional terms. It's going to explain the location of one body structure in relation to another. So if I say my elbow is distal to my shoulder, it means that my elbow is down here from my shoulder that's up here. It means it's below, distal. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about directional terms. So terms that we can use are superior, sometimes cranial or cephalad, is towards the head or the upper part of the body, or inferior, which is toward the bottom, away from the head. Um, so superior, inferior, or directional terms. Ventral or dorsal. Ventral is the front. Dorsal is the back. Easiest way to remember that is, is where is the fin on a shark and what is it called? It is called a dorsal fin and it's on their back. Okay. So dorsal is the back, ventral is the front. Um, kind of easy to remember those. Um, and we can see those terms right here, those directional terms that they're talking about. Superior, 
superior, inferior. So superior means towards the head, inferior means away from the head. Dorsal, sorry, dorsal means towards the back. Ventral means towards the front. Okay. Medial is towards the midline or the middle. Lateral is away from the middle of the body. And intermediate is between a more medial and, and lateral structure. And we'll just look at those on this chart to kind of, or we'll see them here in just a second on the chart and I'll be able to explain them. Proximal is close to the origin of the body part or attachment and distal is farther away. Um, I used that as an example just a minute ago. So if this, if we drew imaginary line right down the middle of somebody, um, this would be the medial or the midline. Oftentimes we refer to this as the midline. So um, when we're talking about um, right and left, we're talking, we're referring them from the midline. Um, so, so if we're talking about medial, we're talking about something going towards the middle. If we're talking about lateral, something going away. So if we said someone was right lateral, so it's going to be on this side, you know, to the right side and moving out. Um, and of course, intermediate is a term that's not used that much, but if we wanted to draw a line right here and right here, that's where they're talking about is that intermediate line. Okay. Proximal and distal. Proximal is towards and distal is away. So if we said um, if it's proximal to their, um, I can't tell if that's, if, it, yeah, if it's proximal to their right ankle, um, then it's going to be above their right ankle. If it's proximal to their right knee, it's above the right knee. Proximal to the right hand, it's above the right hand, and so on. So um, if it's distal, so if we have uh, the shoulder here and it's distal to the elbow, that means it's below the elbow or further down. Now, if, 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 it's, if we say it's the shoulder here and we say it's distal to the shoulder, we're talking about this limb and not the body. So... Um, usually we use proximal and distal in terms typically relating to limbs like the arm or the leg, that kind of thing. Rarely do we use it um, in, in relation to the, the rest of the body. Sometimes it'll be used that way, but not very often. Um, superficial is toward the surface of the body. Um, and uh, deep is away from the body surface, which is much more internal. So if we say somebody has a superficial wound, that means that they've got a wound kind of at the surface. And if they have a deep wound, that means they have a wound that actually goes much deeper into the body. So those are kind of easy. Um, and of course we see, here's our distal one here that we just talked about. So if we say a way, if we wanted to refer to something that, that was, um, you know, between the hand, uh, between the, the hand and the elbow, we would say, well, it's distal, it's, it's three inches distal to the elbow and, and four and a half inches, um, proximal to the wrist, you know, or something like that, those kind of terminology that we're going to use. Okay. Okay. Ventral, um, anterior, the ventral part of the body is the front part of the body. So when we look at regional terms, we'll look at the front part of the body and everything associated with that. We can see a whole wide variety of things that are, um, terminology that's often used um, in uh, when we're talking about the ventral or the front side of the body. Um, cephalic always means head, um, so we're talking about the head. Um, the frontal, of course, is the front. It's usually right around the forehead, usually. Orbit is the eye. Nasal is the nose. Buccal, um, the mouth, um, or uh, the cheek. Uh, oral is the mouth. Um, and uh, the mental, which is always kind of weird is the chin. Um, once we get into these particular parts of the body or, or we start talking about bone structures and that kind of thing, these will become a whole lot easier to understand um, because you'll start to get, uh, you'll start to have much more of a reference point with them. So, um, but you know, we can use these, this terminology for the upper limb. A lot of times we use this, the brachial, um, when we're, you know, Starting an IV, sometimes we'll we'll put it in the brachial vein, um, umbilical area, the inguinal area, or the groin, um, the patella area. Um, so these are just regional terms that we can use when we're trying to describe something that we've noticed on the body. 
or something that we're trying to describe or explain. Maybe we're trying to document where someone's pain is or where a, where a wound is or a bruise or a cut or a scrape or, you know, that kind of thing, or where they're fixing to have surgery. So uh, it's just that regional terminology that we're going to use. There's no easy way to do that. You're just going to have to do the best you can at studying that. It's a lot of memorization, a lot of practicing and trying to, you know, label that and try to remember where those things are, but it is very helpful. Spend a little bit of time on that and I think it'll pay off. Um, on the back side of the body, the posterior side, um, a few less terms, but not a whole lot less. Um, still a whole lot of, still a lot to remember. Um, so, uh, like I said, spend some time there, uh, trying to understand those and understand where those are at and, and labeling those, um, so that it, it does make it a little bit easier, but I'll be honest with you, the, the more time that you spend in this class, the easier those are going to be to come by. And also then once you get out working in a, in a health related profession, it'll become a whole lot easier to, um, get those, that terminology down pat. Okay. Body planes and sections are another thing that we use. It's basically like drawing an imaginary line through somebody so that we can create different sections um, and right angles and that kind of stuff so that we can describe different things. Um, of course, there's the sagittal, the median, frontal, and transverse sections. And rather than read all these off to you, let's just look at them. So if we'll have, if we have the median or the mid sagittal, it's just right down the middle of the body. Um, the frontal, so the, the median actually separates the right and left halves of the body. And we can see that on a, I believe this is an MRI down here. Um, we can see that on this picture right here. Frontal separates the, the front and the back or the dorsal and ventral. And we see that here. And transverse just kind of right across. Um, I know you may be thinking, what in the world am I going to use this terminology for? But believe me, there will come a time when you're going to have to try to figure out how to document something in such a way that somebody else understands what you're talking about. And these will be very important to you being able to do that. So be familiar with these um, uh, and, and try to get them down pat. The next thing we need to look at is body cavities. Um, and, and please forgive me, I know this chapter is not an exciting chapter, and I'm just kind of reading through this um, and, and hopefully trying to reinforce this just a little bit with you, but there's just not a whole lot of stuff in this particular chapter that, that, that a whole lot of explaining is going to do a whole lot of good for. So two body cavities, there's the dorsal and the ventral. What's good about what, what we use these body cavities for is so... Um, we can understand what is contained in those, but these are actual body cavities. They're actually separated by a membrane of some kind. So this isn't like a, you know, a, a perceived cavity or body cavity or something. These are actual cavities that are separated by some line of distinction. Um, so uh, when we take a look at them, we see the thoracic cavity here in the front, primarily um, heart, lungs, those types of things. And then we have the diaphragm. And then we have the abdominal cavity, and you can imagine what's in there. It's all of those organs and all that stuff that we would expect to be there. Pelvic cavity, um, primarily reproductive organs, part of the colon. Um, and um, let's see, uh, I'm missing one. Oh, the bladder down in there. Cranial cavity, this is part of the dorsal cavity, the cranial and spinal cavity. You see the different colors here. So these cavities are in the dorsal. And these cavities here are in the ventral, um, and you can kind of see how they're broken up. Sometimes we also refer to the abdominal and pelvic cavity as one. We call it the abdominal pelvic cavity. So sometimes that's that's how it's referred to. All right, um, which is kind of what I just gave away there. The dorsal cavity has two subdivisions, cranial, which has the brain, and the spinal, which has the spinal cord. The ventral Cavity is two subdivisions, the thoracic and the abdominal pelvic. Um, the thoracic houses the heart and lungs and all those, like I had said. Abdominal pelvic has all of the other organs, um, and it can be further divided into the abdominal and abdominal pelvic, like we see in that picture. Um, the interesting thing about the abdominal pelvic cavity was we can also divide that into 
four quadrants or nine regions. This is very beneficial when we're documenting something as it relates to the abdomen or the abdominal pelvic area um, because we can further pinpoint where we're talking about and we have reference points. So um, if we look at the four quadrants, we just basically draw a line in the medial part of the body and then transversely across this way. So, and that creates four quadrants of the body, and we can see the organs that are contained in each one of those quadrants. So, when we're doing a quick reference, say, if we've got somebody with a stab wound to the right upper quadrant of the body, and we're trying to let other people know, hey, we've got a 22-year-old male with a stab wound to the right upper quadrant, or the the right upper quadrant of the abdomen, they're immediately going to go, okay, well, this could be very, very bad because there's the liver there, there's the stomach and those types of things. Um, or if we say, hey, it's the, the left lower quadrant, um, they can go, okay, well, we do have, um, you know, organs there, but it's a, probably a little less urgently life-threatening. Now, there is still life-threatening, but it's less urgently life-threatening because we'd have to worry about them bleeding out. The risk would be much more along the lines of infection than it would be about bleeding. We can also divide the abdomen or the abdominal pelvic cavity into regions. Regions are even more specific to a given area. Um, and we can, if we, if we break these down a little bit, I think I can make you understand them a little bit more, especially if you've already taken a medical terminology class. The right hypochondriac region, um, if you if you real, remember if you break this terminology down what is a chondro uh, chondro is cartilage and the bottom part of the rib cage here is comprised of predominantly cartilage so the right hypo hypo means below the chondriac region so it's just below the rib cage right here so see what see what i'm saying um epigastric region the stomach is called the gastro um or the, the terminology um, terminology for stomach is gastro. And we see that gastric right here, gastro means stomach, epi means above, so it's above the stomach. It's the region above the stomach. Left hypochondriac, same. Right lumbar region, so right in here is where the lumbar spine comes through, so it's the right lumbar, left lumbar. Umbilical region, because the, it's where the, you know, the, um, Belly button is is where the umbilical cord connected, you know, when we were born. Uh, the right iliac, because right here is the iliac of the pelvis, um, left iliac. Um, and then the hypo, which hypo means below, the below gastric region, so below the gastric. So those regions are very helpful in, in our documentation when we're trying to narrow down and pinpoint um, what's going on and we can see over here on the right what's contained in each one of those so if we said hey we've got a stabbing in the right upper quadrant um, we could actually go a little bit further in that and go well actually it is in the right hypochondriac region um, which would caught which would be a big cause of alarm because that's mainly made up of the liver um, so that, that would be a pretty scary injury all right some other cavities include the oral cavity, nasal cavity, orbital cavities, middle ear cavities. All of those cavities we're going to talk about later. Uh, just didn't want you to think that um, there was no more cavities in the body. Okay, so that is, my friends, that is um, the end of chapter one. Um, so kind of cool uh, that we got through chapter one. Um, uh, Go ahead and do your homework for this chapter. You can take your test at any time for this chapter. Just remember that all the homework and tests and assignments and discussion board postings and all of that stuff is due um, on Sunday night. All of your assignments are going to be due on Sunday night. Now, hopefully that doesn't change, and I'll hopefully I'll have to redo my videos. But don't forget to watch your deadlines and your due dates for when your assignments are due. And I will see you guys on Chapter 2.